Hey, leader, and welcome to another episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast, where we are obsessed with helping you grow to your maximum potential and to maximize the impact of your leadership. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host, and today's episode is brought to you by my friends at Baritung Advisors. We're also recording live from the new Return.com studio. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here, and I hope that you enjoy our content and become a subscriber. Know that you can also watch all of our episodes over on our YouTube channel, so make sure you're subscribed there as well. And as always, if the podcast has made an impact on your life and you've been a regular listener, it would mean the world to me if you'd leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever app you listen to podcasts through. That really does help us to grow our audience and reach more leaders, so thank you in advance for that. Well, Leader, I am super excited about today's episode because you are going to hear my conversation with Matt Keller, who's been a long-term mentor in my life, and I'm so grateful for him. This is his second time on the podcast. He was a speaker at our L3 One Day Conference, and he's very loved by the L3 community, and so I can't wait to share his voice with you again. If you don't know Matt, let me just tell you a little bit about him. He is the founding pastor of Next Level Church in Fort Myers, Florida. He's known for his passionate and humorous communication style. He travels and speaks frequently, inspiring and teaching leadership both inside and outside the church world. He writes frequent articles on his website, mattkelleronline.com, and can be found on Twitter at Matthew Keller. Matt and his wife, Sarah, have two boys, Will and Drew, and his favorite candy continues to be Skittles. (laughs) And in our conversation, we talk all about his new book, Donkey Mission, and why donkey missions are so critical in your journey. And you may be saying, well, what's a donkey mission? Well, you are about to find out, so get ready. Uh, Matt also talks about the importance of humility and leadership and shares some very vulnerable lessons that he learned in a dark season of his life. And of course, I take him through the lightning round as well. So get ready, buckle up. But before we dive into the conversation, just a few announcements. This episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast is sponsored by Baratung Advisors. The financial advisors at Baratung Advisors help educate and empower clients to make informed financial decisions. You can find out how Baratung Advisors can help you develop a customized financial plan for your financial future by visiting their website at baratungadvisors.com. That's B-E-R-A-T-U-N-G advisors.com. Securities and investment products and services offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA and SIPC, Baritung Advisors, LPL Financial, and L3 Leadership are separate entities. I also want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. They're a jeweler by my friend and mentor, John Henny. And my wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and wedding rings through Henny Jewelers and had an incredible experience. And not only do they have great jewelry, but they also invest in people. In fact, for every couple that comes in engaged, they give them a book to help them prepare for marriage. And we just love that. So if you're in need of a good jeweler, check out hennyjewelers.com. And I also want to thank our new sponsor, Return.com. And Leader, let me just ask you this. Have you ever had an interest in investing in real estate? Well, now for as little as $500, you can become a commercial real estate investor. Just visit Return.com to learn more. That's R-E-I-T-U-R-N.com. Investing involves risk. Please consult the Return Offering Circular if you're interested in investing. And with all that being said, let's dive right in. Here's my conversation with Matt Keller. Matt Keller, it is such an honor to just get to spend some time with you. Uh, We've had a a long-term mentoring relationship over the past few years, and I was just telling you how significant of a voice uh, that you've had in my life and my leadership journey, and uh, and I'm forever grateful for you. And it's been a long time uh, since you were first on the podcast, so very excited to have you back. And I just wanted to start with just leaving this open-ended, but what are you learning right now in your leadership journey? Well, uh, I mean, the first thing I'm learning is that Doug Smith continues to be awesome, man. I just want you to know how proud of you I am and how excited I am for you. And just, yes, a a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, we were both a lot younger, Doug. Uh, I I was on the podcast. I was one of the OGs. And so uh, it's just, uh, what am I learning? So thank you again for the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you. Anytime I can be with with Doug Smith, I am am always better for it. And I mean that. So uh, what am I learning right now? Good question. I think um, I think I'm learning patience um, mm. in my life right now, and not in. I mean, we. I guess we all kind of typically say that, right? Like, don't pray for patience because you know God might answer your prayer, kind of thing. Uh, I mean, most people know. Maybe you don't know. I, I live in Southwest Florida, Fort Myers, Florida, and so last September, September 28th, uh, Hurricane Ian hit. Um, we took a direct hit on a major Category Four hurricane, and. Um, honestly, you know, nothing like a storm like that to just obliterate our coastline first and foremost in our community. I mean, just everyone was affected in some way. 60,000 homes were either completely lost or majorly damaged. 8,000 businesses were lost locally. Um, 360,000 cars were lost. 
uh, in the state of Florida. So, you know, so what that does is it really disrupts your plans hmm. um, in every way. I mean, it just, you know, really just sent us into a, a whole different mindset as it relates to leading next level church our next level relational network of churches and just pastoring our city differently. And of course, a lot of personal things then start to just instantly become non, you know, urgent things. Wow. And, and so I would say, yeah, I think I'm learning patience um, in a, okay, God, I just trust your timing on all things sort of way. That's so good. And, and that's, I wanted to dive in, you know, since the last time you we were on the podcast and as I've watched your journey from afar, you know, a few years ago, you were really, really focused on getting into the leadership space. You had your own leadership podcast. You had a, a one-day conference that was incredible uh, and reaching thousands of leaders. And then uh, at some point in your journey, you actually decided to, to lay all that down. Can you talk about just obedience and humility? Because I, I, I'm, my assumption is that that was really, really challenging for you. And you're talking about patience and, and laying down your wants. Can you talk about that journey and, and what leaders can gather from it, at least what you did? Yeah. Um, you know, I think six or so years ago, Doug, uh, as you're talking about, I had a real encounter with the Holy Spirit um, and the Lord just really spoke to my heart and said, uh, in terms of my calling, um, my personal calling, because um, I'm a pastor, but I'm also a leader of leaders um, and, you know, thought leader in a lot of ways, or at least I used to be. Um, and, you know, my life was really kind of at a crossroads and I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, Matt, um, I've called you to be a father um, mm. in the church. Uh, and so I want you to to lay aside um, what you're doing right now in terms of the leadership community, business leadership. You know, a lot of those spaces that I was really starting to be active in and write toward and, and speak in and um, and really just do that. So it was a sacrifice, but um, in a lot of ways, but it wasn't. And I really just felt in my heart that the Holy Spirit said, Matt, um, I don't need one more. Uh, you know, gifted corporate trainer. What I need is for you to be a father to my people and a father to pastors. And wow. so um, it was it was a big sacrifice, but it wasn't. And it has been I've, I've never been more fulfilled in my life than I am right now. Um, I've never been happier than I am in my life right now. Uh, and I just I love what I get to do. I love pastoring Next Level Church. I love pastoring the pastors in our network family of churches. We have about 142 churches right now, I think, uh, across North America. And um, and so I'm thankful. So I think the leadership lesson for leaders would be, um, especially leaders of faith um, or that, you know, faith is a, is a driving component of their life is um, there are crossroad moments in our life. And wow. the decision we make in the crossroad will determine the trajectory of our life. And, and I think if I could challenge leaders with any thought today, Doug, it would be be obedient in that moment. Um, don't just necessarily do follow what is what is, you know, the logical, you know, decision to make or the logical direction, but really, you know, seek the Lord again, if you're a person of faith and follow what he says, because God has a way of meeting us right where we are and taking us exactly where he wants us to be. It's, it's interesting. You know, you say how you're more fulfilled than you've ever been, which is the fruit of your obedience, which is incredible. I'm curious, looking back, you know, where you were pre that journey, pursuing all those things, because, you know, this is a leadership podcast. A lot of leaders always aspire for more influence, more platform. And ultimately, I think their motives are right, right? It's like, man, I just want to help more people. But I do think that there can be an unhealthy, selfish ambition in that. And I think, if correct me if I'm wrong, I think you were meeting with John Maxwell. And uh, didn't he say something to you along the lines of, you know, Matt, if God wants to make you a name, let him do that. How did you have to die to selfish ambition to be obedient in that moment? Or were you just that open to what God wanted to do? Um. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, it was in that season five or six years ago, Doug, that the Lord really just started to reveal my my motives in my heart um, and uh, really just revealed to me that, yes, I wanted to help people. Yes, I wanted to do all of that. But there were also some real, you know, um, impure motives as well uh, mm -hmm. in me uh, with pride and with wanting to make a name for myself and wanting to be famous. And, you know, I actually thought that the more famous I got, the more glory God would get. And the Lord just took me to, to town on that and said, Matt, that's just not true. Um, the end goal of all of this is not fame, it's faithfulness. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, Doug, five plus years later, you know, zooming, zooming forward the story here, I, I can just, I can tell you, I'm so thankful. Uh, there's probably not too many days that go by that I don't actually pray the prayer. God, thank you for not letting me become famous because sure. I think I, I'm, I may have blown it all up. And um, 
So I'm humbled. I'm humbled that I get to do this. I'm hum- humbled that he let me live. Um, <laughs> he could have took it all away. That's for sure. But instead, he's, he's, he's trusted me with the influence of being able to pastor pastors and pastor an incredible church in Southwest Florida called Next Level. And um, I'm humbled every day that I get to do this. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned your leaders of leaders, which that's been clear, at least from my whole observation of your journey. And one thing you're doing as you lay down those things uh, is you and your wife do a brotherhood and sisterhood. And you talked about coaching pastors. Can you talk about you? You said you felt God was calling you to be a father. I think in leadership, and I know you're passionate about the subject. There's, I think you've actually ex- described it as an orphan spirit in so many leaders where they're just insecure and, and they have these father wounds. And so can you talk a little bit about what you do in brotherhood and, and how you father leaders? Because I think that's so instrumental in the world. we live. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we have our next level relational network of churches. And so I mentioned it a moment ago. Um, if they go to nlrn.org, nlrn.org is the easiest website to find that. And so really it is, it's a, we'd like to say we're a family on mission becoming a movement. And our purpose statement is that we exist to pastor ministry leaders so they can lead healthy and high impact churches. And so everything we do really has those two sides of the coin attached to it. Health and high impact, health and high impact. And so whether you're a church leader or a, or a business leader, whatever kind of leader you are right now, mid-level manager, a CEO, um, those two categories uh, are are really what's most important, which is the health of our organizations and the high impact that our organizations are making. So for us, we work you know, exclusively with churches and pastors and couples. And so uh, we believe, we truly believe that if lead couples are healthy and high impact, then the churches they lead will be healthy and high impact as well. So we do that every single month. So we were using Zoom long before Zoom was Zoom. Like the 2020 (laughs) Zoom, we were using Zoom way back. And so every month for two hours a month, um, you know, we get on brotherhood groups and sisterhood groups. So the ladies get on uh, with a dozen, 12 or 15 other ladies. The guys get on with a dozen or 15 other guys. And uh, and we just, we, Sarah or I, or the two of us record about a 20, 22 minute message and so then they have a group leader and the group leader, you know, they play the video together. They catch up on life. It really is, you know, what you would call a mastermind group. We're doing that for pastors across the country in Canada and uh, it's effective. And so we, we like to say that leaders as leaders, we learn best, we lead best and we live best in group form. And so we love to learn together. We love to live together and we love to lead together in group form. And, and we just think that groups multiply the effectiveness of all three of those areas in our life. And so we like to tell pastors and, you know, lead couples, if, if you have a family, go do that. Like, don't we don't market. We don't do any of that. If, if you have a family, go be a part of that family. Mm-hmm. But if you need a family, if you are, as you just used the phrase a moment ago, Doug, an orphan, then come join us. Come do what we're doing and throw in with us because we're a family on mission. And our mission is to keep pastors in the game because it, ministry is hard today. And pastors and lead couples need community around them. And that's what the relational network is. Yeah, you're talking about the power of groups. You said mastermind groups for us is, is what you guys do. Uh, <laughs> we were just saying before we jumped on, um, when you came and spoke to the L3 One Day Conference, we were having dinner and you were just talking about the power of groups and the family. And you made the statement that, that I share pretty much, I think, every day of my life. But you talked about in groups, every leader needs a place where they're fully known, fully loved, and fully challenged. And uh, man, that has just hit home with everyone I talk to and share. It's the purpose of our mastermind groups. Can you, for me, you originated that statement. Can you just talk more about the importance of those three things in a leader's life? Yeah, it was a good day several years ago when the Lord just illuminated that. We would say, you know, in the church world that how someone is, we would say how they're pastored well is when they are three things, when they're known, loved and challenged. And so that's how you pastor someone well is that they are known, loved and challenged. And so, um, yeah, I have a little teaching on that. As a matter of fact, if you go to nextlevelrelationalnetwork.com, all that's a big one, nextlevelrelationalnetwork.com slash KLC, which is known, love, challenge, KLC. Um, you can watch that. I think it's a 22 or 25 minute video on how I, I have a triangle that if someone is two out of the three, but they're lacking one, here's what's going to happen to them. So that's a great leadership teaching. So there, I, I'm just remembering that right now that I'm like, oh, wait, that exists. You can watch that. Yeah, so we'll put that in the show notes perfect. for sure. That's awesome. Perfect. There you go. Uh, so, yeah. So those really are the three components of someone being pastored or shepherded well or led well, you know, in terms of a mastermind group. And so, you know, the idea of being known is that people really um, feel seen 
that they uh, don't feel invisible, that, you know, it's so easy in leadership for us to just have employees or team members and they just are doing a job. And it's like, well, I kind of know their name, but I don't really know much about them, you know? And it's like, so as our job as leaders, if we can slow down and really just make people feel known, then that improves everything in terms of, of our interactions and their performance, health and high impact in our in our organization. The idea of love is that that person doesn't just feel known or seen, but they actually believe that we as their leader care about them. Do that? Do they actually believe? Not do we believe? Because we go, oh yeah, no, I care. No, no, no. Do they believe that we care about them? And that takes, you know, known to a whole different level is when they actually feel like, no, I'm not just employee 106, which is <laughs> jokingly what I used to call myself um, when I was in a, an organization and the leader was not super attentive. My buddy and I would refer to ourselves as employee 106 and employee 107. <laughs> well, to say, we didn't feel very loved uh, in that organization that we were a part of. But that idea of loved is, does my leader, do I believe my leader really cares about me? And then challenge is the third component of the, of the that triangle um, of how someone is pastored or shepherded well. And so that challenge side of things, you know, some every one of us as leaders, we're good at two out of the three. But there's usually one that we don't like as much. So for me, it's the challenge one, right? That I'm not, I, 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 I don't really, I'm an Enneagram too, I'm a helper. You know, so that challenge side of things, though, is absolutely indispensable. If we're really, truly going to pastor or lead someone well, they have to be known, loved, and challenged. Love it. I want to talk a little bit about confidence. Um, I was sharing with this again before we started the recording. After L3 One Day, and again, you've been such a voice. And, and just I just want to reemphasize the importance of mentorship and asking for feedback. Uh, I asked Matt for feedback after the L3 One Day conference, and he was very, very clear with me and direct. And he talked about being fully challenged. Uh, he said, Doug, uh, you didn't speak at the conference. What's wrong with you? Which I didn't speak at our first conference. But uh, Matt just went on to say, he said, Doug, man, you you have it, but you don't know you have it. And he said, whatever God has to do in you to develop the confidence he needs to, let him do that. And that was a game-changing piece of feedback that you gave me. And I've been on that journey ever since. And I feel like I've grown immensely in the area of confidence. So I'm just curious. It goes back to the orphan spirit as well. Can you just talk about confidence in leadership? It's something I've always looked at in you. I know a lot of leaders struggle with, you know, imposter syndrome. What do you have to say in the area of just leadership and confidence? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think every leader deep down, um, maybe with the exception of a, of a tiny sliver um, that would probably fall into a, a bit of a narcissistic maybe category. And I, I don't want to open a can of worms there, but I think every leader deep down uh, struggles with confidence. And so I think the question really around confidence is where does our confidence come from? Where does our confidence come from? And, you know, for some of us, our confidence comes from our own skills or our own ability. Um, like you said, for some of us, our confidence comes from fake it till you make it kind of a don't, never let them see you sweat, you know, kind of like just push through it and, you know, just kind of pretend it, uh, you know, kind of just muscle it up. Um, but I think the best place for us, and again, we're, we're leaders, both of us, you and I are leaders of faith. And if you're listening right now or watching right now and you're not a leader of faith, then, then you know, that's this probably doesn't apply to you. But for those of us, and I would say the vast majority in our community today are, uh, are people of faith, our, our, true, the, our truest confidence should in leadership should come from who we are in Christ, that our identity is sons and daughters of God. And so, you know, for me, I, I spent a lot, of, a lot of years, you know, wrestling that orphan spirit, a lot of years trying to prove myself, trying to make myself, well, if I could just be in that room, well, if they could just, if people just knew who I was, if I could just write that book, if I just had that title, if I could just speak at that church or speak at that conference, then I'd be something. And, you know, so I think I would challenge people to really wrestle hard with that question of, is there some sort of there or up there, or or notoriety, or name in lights, or that blog, or that how many followers, or that whatever, how many downloads, then then I would. If we find any of those statements in our life, then we can be sure that our confidence is coming from something other than our identity in Christ. And so, Doug, for me, five or six years ago, you know, the Lord really, the same season of brokenness, the Lord really took me through a, a dark valley where I had to wrestle down my sonship in Him. Um, and who he says I am and that I am not Matt Keller, the author. I'm not Matt Keller, the pastor. I'm not Matt Keller, the leadership coach or speaker or friend of so-and-so or, uh, you know, pastor of whatever or leader of whatever. I am Matt Keller, the son, the son of the most high God. And that's the that's the promise 
for us. You know, I think about um, after David slayed Goliath, the question Saul, who was the king, asked all of the servants and subjects around him after David slayed Goliath was, he didn't ask what's his name. He didn't ask whatever. You know what he asked? The question is, he asked, whose son is he? Whose son is he? And when they answered concerning David, the King David, right? Psalm 23, David, that's that guy. Here's what they answered in first Samuel. I believe it's 17, chapter 17 or seven or chapter 18, right in there. You'll right toward the end of the chapter. If I was guessing, I think verse 59, but I'm doing this from memory. So <laughs> but first Samuel 17, 18, right in there. The answer they gave King Saul about David, who had just slayed Goliath was he's the son of Jesse in Bethlehem. And that verse honestly plagued me for a really long time concerning this orphan spirit, because I always felt like David. And when when they answered that way, I went, right, he's the son of Jesse. He's the son of nobody in particular. And I'm just Matt Keller, the son of a salesman and a teacher from a small town in northeast Indiana. You know, who am I? I don't have a famous name. My last name is not, you know, Stanley uh, or or Warren or Graham. You know, I'm a Keller from Northeast Indiana. You know, I'm just Jesse. I'm the son of Jesse of Bethlehem. And five or six years ago, Doug, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Matt, look at the verse again. And and here's what I saw. The Lord said, you're focusing on the wrong part. You're focusing on Jesse. I'm focused on Bethlehem. Hmm. And where was Bethlehem? Bethlehem was the location of promise. Of course, that's where Jesus, the Messiah, came and changed everything. And you and I know that David is the great, 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 great grandfather to Jesus, the Messiah who changed the world. And the Lord said, Matt, for your entire life, you've been focused on the wrong identity. You've been focused on Jesse. When I've been focused on Bethlehem, you are a son of promise. And Doug, that changed my life forever. Wow. Can you tell, I, I think I mentioned you before, 20, fall of 2020 was the darkest season of my life. I had what I call a mental breakdown. Uh, and man, learned so much. I had to go through therapy, you know, and I've talked a lot about this on the podcast. Can you, you know, you kind of mentioned the revelation that you got in the midst of your dark season. Is there anything else? I guess, do you have any advice for leaders who are going through that season? Because I, as I open up and share about my dark season, I, man, I have leaders come up to me in tears saying either I'm in the middle of that or, man, I feel like I'm on the verge of that. If I don't make some changes now, I'm going to be there. Was it just identity issues for you? Was it other things? And, and how was it just spending time with God that brought you out of that? Can you walk us through that? Yeah. I mean, again, I, and I, I can certainly have, I've watched you walk through years and I'm so thankful for your vulnerability and how you, you authentically let us peer through the window of, of the metamorphosis that God took you through. Um, and yeah, I think, I think all of the great leaders walk with a limp. Uh, whether we realize it or not, and whether they're willing to acknowledge it or not. But the truly great ones who endure till the end walk with a limp. Um, and so for me, that was five or six years ago. It'll be six years in May that the Lord really took me through that valley of the shadow of death kind of season like you're describing for you. And um, really just stripped away all that I had built my identity on and um, really started to rebuild my identity in him. Um, I've come to call it the threshold of scary, a threshold mm. of scary. And actually, let me give you another link. So it's next level relational network slash TOS threshold of scary TOS. So if you want to watch, I have about a 40 minute leadership teaching there um, on on this concept of threshold of scary, which I think could become a great book because mm. God takes us up to these thresholds in our life. And what everything we know and is familiar to us is behind us and it's in the bright light. But then there's sort of we're standing on this threshold and it's scary because the, what's in front of us is this dark, deep valley that's unknown that we can't see how far it lasts, how long, how deep it is or how long it will last. But the only way to get to the next mountain in our life is to go down through this threshold of scary valley. It's James chapter four, where he talks about really a season of, of grieve, mourn and wail, like it's a season mm. of a stripping away. So if, if your listeners want to go and, and watch that message, they can. If you want to show it to your team or your staff yeah. or whatever, obviously it's all for you. You're welcome to it. So um, so for me, that was a season of a threshold of scary, but I'm so glad that I crossed it uh, because we're never the same. If we turn back, we become, as First Timothy chapter 3, I think, says, um, we, we have all, all of the knowledge base, but we have uh, but deny the power thereof. And there is a denial of power, and we end up in this doom loop, as Jim Collins would call it, in our life. But instead, we have to cross that threshold of scary, go through the valley of brokenness 
to come to the next mountaintop that God has for us. And that's what happened to me six years ago. And it sounds like that's what that's the version of that happened to you a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I never want to go through that again. But the what God did in, in my life and now is doing through my life as a result of that, I wouldn't trade for anything in the world either. So I, I, yeah, I haven't watched that talk by you. So yeah, we'll include a link to that and all the other resources Matt has mentioned in the show notes. And uh, speaking of resources, you have a new book out. Love, love, love your books. And uh, it's called Donkey Mission. So it was funny when I first saw this, it's like, you know, you've written multiple books. I know up the middle church, God of the underdogs. And I'm like, Donkey Mission. <laughs> what is that? I, I love the title. And the tagline is finding purpose when life seems pointless. Uh, we'll dive into it, but just open ended. You know, what, what is Donkey Mission? Why do you write this? And what do you want readers to get out of it? Yeah, great question. Well, I'm super excited about this book um, and, and I really am excited about the message of the book, Donkey Mission, uh, because it comes from a story in 1 Samuel chapter 9, 1 Samuel chapter 9, where um, a guy named Saul, his dad Kish, sends him out to find some lost donkeys. Now, of course, we all know, if you know anything about Old Testament scripture, the Bible, uh, you know that Saul became the first king over Israel. But before he was king, he had to go out on what looked like a seemingly pointless donkey mission to find these lost donkeys from his dad. And he and his buddy, a servant he took with him, go out. It takes several days. It's not going well. The theologians tell us they, they literally hiked over 30 miles looking for these stupid donkeys. It seemed pointless. It's, who cares? His pride and ego kicked in. He wanted to give up. But it was the donkey mission that God was using as a divine setup to lead him to the greater mission. Because at the same time Saul was on the donkey mission, God was speaking to Samuel, the prophet of the day, the spokesperson for God for the entire nation of Israel, about a young man who would come and show up at his doorstep literally 24 hours later. And he was going to become the first king over Israel. So donkey missions are something that are inevitable for all of our lives. And donkey missions that seem pointless and, and problematic are always leading to a greater mission in our life if we'll stay on them. Yeah, I love, love, love this book. I actually thought it was interesting. You talked about your first donkey mission in your life. And I actually thought, it was, like, if you would have told me the story of what your first donkey mission would have been, I wouldn't have guessed what you shared. Do you, do you recall what you shared in the book? Yeah, yeah. So I got saved. Yeah. And then, um, and then, yes. I, so I got called into ministry that following yeah. summer. I come back and meet with my pastor and I'm like, you know what? I, I feel called to preach. Like God's going to use me in my generation. And he says to me, my pastor says to me, great. We have a middle school boys Sunday school class that needs lead. And it meets in the back trailer of our church. Everybody else had heat <laughs> in Indiana. We didn't have heat in the little back trailer. And so for a, a, a long period of time, several months, maybe even a year, I was the the school of the Bible, 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, middle school boys, Sunday school teacher. And um, and I had to wear my suit, you know, because I was 16 and a man of God. And so I would go back there and they'd sit on these cold metal chairs. And I just remember so many Sundays waking up and just feeling like, what am I doing? Like these kids were, were up all night playing Nintendo. Their parents dragged them to church. They didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be there. But that was a donkey mission that God used to start to develop that preaching and teaching gift in me. Yeah. And, and often it seems so mundane. And, and you actually mentioned in the book that, you know, when you're doing donkey missions or faced with seemingly pointless tasks or missions from God, uh, oftentimes we have a choice. And, and if we're not careful, I remember this happened to me. Um, our mutual friend, Larry Betancourt, I started interning from him. Uh, in 2000, I don't, I don't remember that, but 2003. And I remember my only job the whole first year of interning was washing pitchers uh, and setting up and tearing down from youth group. All the other interns got really cool jobs. They got to do offering. They got to, you know, speak. And then I actually, I went to, I, I quit the internship. I'm like, this is stupid. And, uh, and basically Larry yelled at me. And he's like, man, have you actually prayed about this? And I hadn't. And he encouraged me to pray about it. And basically, I don't, I won't tell the whole story, but God spoke to me very significantly through a passage in Isaiah 49. And I basically just said, God, whatever you want, like whatever mission you have for me, I'm in. But I, looking back, it was like I had a choice in the middle of that moment where if I would have quit and just ignored Larry's advice and not spent time with God, like we would not be having this conversation today. And so can you talk about the choices we're faced when we can either run to God and embrace it or run from him? Any, any thoughts there when it comes to leaders feeling like what they're doing is insignificant? 
Absolutely. I mean, I think all of us listening today could are instantly already, aren't we, starting to think of those moments in our path where it just looked like this was pointless. It was, this is stupid. I don't want to do this. These are dumb donkeys, right? Like we all have those donkey mission moments in our leadership journey. And yet looking back, we can see with God's providence, oh, that was a divine setup. God was working something in my character. God was dealing with my pride. God was setting something up. I wouldn't have met my my spouse if I hadn't been distracted and flunked out and had to go back and take summer classes. Like We all have those donkey mission moments where in the moment it looks like this is pointless. I don't understand what's happening here. But the reality is something greater is going on and God works it all together for good. And so, you know, from a leadership level, I think it's so important for us to just recognize that, that you know, when we're feeling impatient or we feel like, well, this is sideways energy or I've been, maybe even it's backward. Like, I feel like I'm taking three steps back because of this for us in that moment to go, you know what? Hold on. Something greater is going on. And so, so wow. in cha- it almost changes our focus. Again, for those of us who are people of faith, it changes how we pray because most of us in a donkey mission pray, God, get me out of this. God, deliver me. <laughs> God I don't want to do this. God, help me get through this as fast as I can. When what, uh, what we should be praying and saying is, God, what do you want me to be learning right now? What are you trying to do in me right now? God, what are you trying to, to get out of me right now? And so the hope is that our donkey missions, when we recognize that they actually might be and are pointing to something greater, they actually have the power to change us. And the truth is, again, look at any leader, great leader that we admire, secular or Christian or otherwise. And what you'll always see in their story, if you look deep enough, is there are some significant donkey missions that had they not taken them, they would not have become the leader that you and I know, love, respect and you know, honor today. It is the donkey missions of our life that shape us into who we are. Yeah, and you mentioned donkey missions that have to do with character development, and oftentimes, so often, that is why we're we're doing them. And I love this one chapter that you had just about sometimes donkey missions are dealing with the little foxes in our lives, and there are little struggles in our character issue that if we don't deal with them now, they're going to wreak havoc in our future. And and I loved if you're willing to open up on the podcast about you know your struggle and the little fox that you shared in the book. I thought that was so powerful about how that could potentially impact your marriage and even how you got through that. Are you willing to, to share that? Yeah, absolutely. So in chapter five of the book, uh, I get very vulnerable and I, I talk about um, that uh, pornography was a little fox to quote um, Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse 14, uh, that verse that says it's the little foxes that destroy the vineyard. Um, you know, by and large for us, it, it won't be the big things. It's the little things. And so for me, I was exposed to pornography at a young age. And, and so um, that was a vice all through my teenage years. And then Sarah and I got married and it continued to be a vice. And so she and I uh, were sitting newly married in our early 20s um, and it was sitting in a movie and the trailer came on and it talked about, you know, something in the trailer said, you know, uh, can a marriage survive 15 years, you know, whatever. And as I'm sitting there holding my wife's hand, my, my young, new, you know, little wife's hand, uh, the Holy Spirit is just convicting me and saying, Matt, speaking to my heart, Matt your marriage and your ministry will not survive 15 years if you don't deal with this. And so we went across the parking lot after the movie and sat in a a booth at Cheddar's uh, restaurant and ordered a cookie monster dessert. And over that cookie monster (laughs) dessert, I confessed to my wife. Um, And, you know, I don't remember exactly all of the things that were said that night. I know that I looked at her and I said, I'm not okay. And I, I have a problem and I need to tell you about it. And God bless her, man. She was so, so gracious and just so kind and so loving and so uh, unconditionally just said, okay, well, we're going to get through this. And, uh, you know, that led me on a journey that led to my freedom from all of that, you know, and I'm just so thankful for the grace of God and his freedom and thankful that Sarah and I a year ago celebrated 25 years of marriage Ooh, let's go. Six years now. And uh, so the answer to the question that was asked in that movie trailer is, can a marriage survive 15 years? The answer is yes, at least for Matt and Sarah Keller. And so, you know, it is the grace of God. Um, But what I challenge people in chapter five of the book with their little foxes is to really um, not not just look at those over and not just go, well, you know, yes, yeah, you know, my mom was a worrier. So I'm a worrier. Well, you know, my, my dad was a whatever. Well, my grandfather was, a, you know, hey, no, 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 no. Come on. God uses donkey missions in our life to bring to our awareness those things that have the power to destroy our future if we don't deal with them now. I've often said and heard it said as well uh, by other prominent leaders that what we don't deal with in our 20s has the power to destroy us in our 30s, 40s, and 50s. 
Wow. And so I would just say to you leaders, listen, whether you're 20s in your 20s or whether you're 30, 40, 50 or beyond, hey, listen, it's not too late. Now is the time for you to deal with those little foxes. And so what do you do? Well, hopefully you're in a group. Hopefully you're in a mastermind. Hopefully you've got yeah. people around you who know, love you and, and challenge you. And it's time to confess. It's time to open up. It's time to, to come clean on that and to bring what's in the dark in your life into the light. Because I've said for years that what's in the dark in our life grows in its control and power over us. But what we bring into the light has the power to shrink in its power and control over us. That's the power of confession. That's the power of community. That's the power of bringing those things into the light and letting the Lord deal with them and, and show it, cover us with his grace and bring healing to our lives. Yeah, Matt, this is huge. You know, one of our, our core values at L3 is character development. I say all the time character development is the most important development. And uh, I'm greatly interested, and you were talking about it earlier, longevity uh, and leaders making it to their finish line and actually finishing the ministry that God put in their hands. Uh, I had a, a mentor tell me once that he believes about 2% of Christian leaders actually make it to their finish line intact and fulfill what God actually called them to. And you've been in, in the ministry game. You're certainly not your finish line, but you've been in it long enough where you've seen people fall. And more often, I'm just curious, and when it comes to character development, is there anything else you would say? Is it just simply bringing things to light? And if some of these leaders would have done that earlier, uh, they would have you know, safeguarded themselves from falling? Or is there any other patterns or warnings that you would give us as leaders? Because, um, man, yeah, I, my heart breaks every single time I you know, get a, a letter saying, hey, look, this guy fell, this guy fell. It's just it's devastating. Yeah, it is devastating. And to hear that percentage, you know, whether it's accurate or close to being accurate or whatever, it doesn't matter. One in 50. I mean, 2% is one in 50. Wow. I mean, Doug, that's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. And so, yeah, I mean, I think for us as leaders, we we have to be accountable. Um, and, and we are only as accountable as we choose to be. Sure. Um, and so for us as leaders, it's it's easy for us to just kind of do our thing and we're all high octane, you know, adrenaline, testosterone, like go get them, like go charge them out. Like that's what makes us great leaders. Right. But, but, you know, Jesus uses the word meek blessed are the meek. Uh, he says in the sermon on the Mount, and there's something to meekness and meekness. I've never forgotten this definition. I heard a long time ago for the, for the idea of meekness is power under control. And so, mm. you know, it's, it's the horse and the rider kind of illustration that, you know, a horse is more powerful than the rider. Like the truth of the matter is the horse is a giant animal <laughs> that weighs you know, over a thousand pounds. And yet the definition of me meekness, the idea, the picture of that is that a horse willingly submits with the bridle in its mouth to the will of the rider. And that's what we as high octane, high adrenaline, big vision leaders, you know, we're going to change the world. Let's go get them. Like whatever we're leading, whatever it is that God set our hand to, we have to take that power. We have to take that leadership. We have to take all of that and we have to willingly place it under submission first and foremost to the Lord through the Holy spirit. We have to place it under the submission of, to the Lord. And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The Bible says in, in Proverbs uh, or Psalm chapter 19, verse nine, it says that the fear of the Lord brings cleanness, enduring forever. And so watch this inside of that verse, Psalm 19, nine is the fear of the Lord brings cleanness. That's talking about holiness. That's the part that we play. God sets us free when it's salvation, right? Jesus cleanses us. But then there's an ongoing work of that's justification. What we do is sanctification. That's our part. That's holiness. So watch this. The fear of the Lord brings cleanliness, cleanness. And then that leads us to watch enduring forever. In other words, those are the ones who finish the race. But watch this, Doug. It's not the love of the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord. And when you look at a leader who has lost not their love for God, but their fear of God. And I'm not talking about being afraid of God. I'm talking about fearing God, holy reverence and awe of God. It's the leaders who lose their fear of God that then lose their cleanness that ultimately then don't endure forever. They don't finish the race. So if I could say anything to leaders right now, and again, I'm a person of faith, I would say, how's your fear of the Lord? Because that affects your cleanness. And your cleanness is the indicator, the Bible says to whether you'll endure forever, whether you'll actually finish the race. So so when I talk about submission, when I talk about humility, when I talk about meekness, power under control, horse and the rider, that's what I'm talking about.
That that's that's brilliant. I, I actually just a few episodes ago, leaders, if you're listening, I interviewed John Bevere, and he actually I think it just came out yesterday. He yes, just came out with a book, The Awe of God. I mean, essentially, I was literally going to recommend that book. Uh, that's exactly. I'm reading it. I'm halfway done right uh, now. John's oh, coming to speak to you at our, our our event next week. Oh, that's awesome. He, well, he said this. Yeah, same thing. Man, I just think that's so true and so powerful. So thank you for sharing that. Um, another thing you said in the book, actually, I thought this was a great revelation, but I thought it was so profound. You said your future provision is found in your current donkey mission. Like, and, and when you shared examples in your life, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Like, can you talk about that? I just love that statement. Yeah. I mean, as I survey my life, um, you know, I look on at things that I thought were just small, you know, small little things, insignificant little opportunities, you know, oh, I went and, you know, spoke at a leadership lesson at a, you know, a, a dentist's office or a, to their team or at a blah, 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 you know, just a small little thing in a back room with poor lighting and no music stand for my notes. Right. And yet it has been those sort of little donkey mission, you know, type of experiences and opportunities that suddenly became for me, you know, messages, leadership messages that have shaped my life. So, for example, um, I have a, a leadership teaching, probably the biggest, um, most popular leadership teaching. I've literally taught it to tens of thousands of leaders over the last almost 15 years now. Um, and it's called Six Invisible Keys to Making the Jump, How Organizations Grow. And I tell the story in the book that um, I got a call uh, way back in 2008 um, from Billy Hornsby, who was the founder of the ARC, the Association Related Church, who's a spiritual father to me. And he called me and he said, Matt, I have a, a pastor's event in, in Amarillo, Texas, that I need you to go preach for me. And I'm like, great. So I jumped on a plane, flew out there. And it was the very first time that I ever taught the S-curve or six invisible keys to making the jump. Like it was so new. The concepts were so brand new. Doug, that I didn't even have a graphic. Like the whole thing was based on this imagery of how, how we make the jump from one S curve of growth to the next, blah, blah, blah. And literally, I didn't even have a graphic. I just stood up and taught the six invisible keys. Well, Doug, I have taught that leadership lesson literally to tens of thousands of leaders. And I still do today, which, by the way, next level relational network, <laughs> S curve, the letter S, the word. You can watch it there if you want. Take your team through it. There you go. Hey, I'm just giving you all this stuff today. So uh, anyway, so that S-curve came from a donkey mission to a place called Amarillo, Texas. Like who in the world goes to Amarillo? I don't even know what's there. And God opened the door. And I've literally taught that one teaching to more leaders than probably all my other teachings in mind. Like it's it's that, but it was a donkey mission. So your future provision is found in your donkey mission. That's so good. Well, we've waited the appetite around the book a lot. Is there anything else you'd want to share about donkey mission before? I want to dive into the lightning round with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the only other thing I would say is when I wrote this book, Donkey Mission, um, which you can go to donkeymission.com or just go to Amazon. It's on Amazon. Um, you're, everyone can get it there. Uh, really, there were two things in my heart. One was the message of the book. The second was I really believe there's a spirit of evangelism on this message. So the book is very small. Then I, I made it to fit in your back pocket kind of thing. Yeah. And the reason why is it's very non-threatening. And of course, the title is super fun. And so uh, if churches want to do the series called What's the Point?, um, and, and use leverage the book, they can go to donkeymission.com. All the information is there. And we make the book available. It's a $15 book retail. We make it available to churches in bulk for $5. Um, we have a full money back guarantee. If they don't sell the books, you can bring them back. And the whole point of that is that pastors and churches can do the series. It's a six week church growth campaign where they do two weeks on evangelism, where you teach your people how to be witnesses. And we give you all the graphics, all my sermon notes, everything. And then four weeks of the donkey mission. What's the point series? So for six weeks, your people are really um, being encouraged then to not buy one, but take twenty dollars and buy four. Keep one for yourself, and then use the other three as invitations to the series. Doug, we've seen uh, just recently some of our churches have have seen a thirty percent jump in attendance on the first week of the series, wow. and so um, we just really want to help churches grow. And we feel like this message is for everybody. It's a simple, digestible, fun, easy, creative message for non-Christians and, uh, you know, unchurched people too. So if pastors want to do that, we really would love for them to go to Donkey Mission. It's all free. Everything you need is free, uh, including the avail availability of $5 books. So just go to donkeymission.com. That's beautiful. And again, we'll include links to all of that in the show notes. Thank you for all. You are a resource machine, my friend. And uh, just thank <laughs> I you. I just for want to help people, you know. Yeah, thanks for putting everything out. Uh, I don't think we had a lightning round uh, whenever I first interviewed you. And if we did, the questions have certainly changed. So just want to take you through a bunch of fun questions I ask in every interview. And the first is, what is the best advice you've received, ever received, and who gave it to you? 
You know, I, I, here's what I'll go with. I'll go with this uh, this quote. Uh, Ron Sylvia, who pastors the Springs in Ocala, Florida, and was really kind of a first mentor uh, and coach to me, pastoral coach. He said, Matt, let the ball come to you. Let the ball come to you. Mm-hmm. And and of course, he could see sitting across that Starbucks table that morning that I was this young, energetic you know, go chase the world, go climb every mountain, go get the trophy kind of guy. And he looked at me and he said, Matt, let the ball come to you. If you chase the ball, you'll never get it. You'll never catch it. But if you wait and let God pass you the ball, then it'll be exactly the right ball at the right time for you to take the right shot. So that's that's some really good advice. And I honor Ron Sylvia. I'm so thankful for his voice in my life in those years. Wow. I don't know if the answer would be the same, but if you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Yeah, I think uh, so. Here's a quote. I think I would. I, I think I would put the quote up there. One touch from God can change everything. Mm. And maybe if there's going to be something on my tombstone, if I have a tombstone, they do cremation here in Florida. So, um, <laughs> so the quote would be, um, "One touch from God can change everything." And we say that across our church all the time. We just really, truly believe that one touch from God has the power to change everything. Yeah, it's, it's been a while since we connected. Is there a book or two in the past few years that's impacted you in a profound way? Yeah, well, the answer to that question is Awe of God. Uh, everyone needs to read The Awe of God by John Bevere. And so, uh, right, if he's on the podcast a few episodes ago, scroll down, listen to that interview, and then go to Amazon and buy The Awe of God. I think that is a word, a right now word for our generation, uh, certainly in the body of Christ. And so I would highly recommend uh, The Awe of God um, as, as a book. Yeah, so I'll go with that one. At this point in your journey, what would you say is your biggest leadership regret throughout your journey? Pride. Mm. Pride. Selfish ambition. I heard Robert Morris say um, a while back that you never see the word ambition in the Bible without the word selfish in front of it. And uh, and, and so that was me for a lot of years. Um, and I would have told you that I was humble, Doug. I would have told you that I was doing it for all the right reasons. And I actually thought I was. But um, when I really, truly gave God permission to search my heart, I realized, oh, as Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. And so mm-hmm. I'm just really, really thankful that God let me live and let me do this. Yeah. Well, I'm thankful we gave that to you, too. And thank you for sharing with our audience today. Um <clears throat> You get to spend time with a lot of high-level leaders. I'm just curious, do you have a go-to question or two when you're having dinner with them that you always ask? Yeah, absolutely. So I call it the frame it up, then shut up principle. And so (laughs) here's what that, which leads to the greatest question, ready? Which I believe, Andy Stanley wrote the book a long, long time ago called um, The Best Question Ever, which is in light of my past experiences, my present circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing to do, which I completely think is the best question ever. I have the greatest question ever for leaders. Okay. So here's the greatest question ever. Ready? So don't tell Andy, but here you go. Uh, So I think the greatest question ever that a leader can ask another leader is if you were me, what would you do? Mm. If you were me, what would you do? And so I like to describe it this way. Take no more than three minutes and frame up your situation, which by the way, this is in chapter 12, the key to everything book on teachability. So I write this out. So frame it, take no more than three minutes, frame up your situation So I call it frame it up, then shut up and ask this question. So in light of that frame, what I just told you, if you were me, what would you do? And here's why the power of that question, Doug, for leaders is it takes all of their lifetime of wealth, of experience, knowledge, wisdom. And it literally in a moment, if you were me, what would you what would you do? Switch a seat. So now it puts all of their life experience, all of their wisdom, and it puts it in your chair and you get a personalized answer through their leadership, life, and wisdom for your situation. So I think that's the best, great, the greatest leadership question anyone can ask. Wow. What's your biggest leadership pet peeve? Pet peeve? Um, yeah. When people want more responsibilities uh, and opportunities, and they ain't even doing their their first job well. <laughs> <laughs> Just go back to your desk and get it. Your, oh, what you're God. supposed to be done, what we're paying you for. Go do that. Just stop asking for more and better and greater and different. Just go do what we what we ask you to do in the first place. That's a bit. Yeah, I don't sense any energy coming out of you when you share that. <laughs> My whole demeanor changed. Right? Uh, I don't know if you have an actual bucket list or not, but if you do, or what is something you've done in your life that you believe everyone should experience before they die? <laughs> 
fly over the Grand Canyon. Uh, I've had I've had the opportunity to do that twice in the last few years. So the first one was in a helicopter with my mom and dad uh, in September of 2019. And we rented you can rent a little helicopter for an hour or two and they fly you out over the Grand Canyon. It's ridiculous. It's so gorgeous. And then last uh, about a year ago, right now, last February 2022, Sarah and I went out with our friends uh, and we rented a plane and flew over the Grand Canyon. And it is it is a spectacle like it's it is so amazing to fly over the Grand Canyon. So that's there you go. I'd say that. love it. Yeah, I'll add it to my bucket list. And then oh, can I say one more? Can I say no, one more? Please. I, I, I love, love getting like baseballs at a baseball game. Like that is my favorite <laughs> hobby. That it truly is my favorite hobby. Last year, I got 65 baseballs. Uh, the year before, they got 125. OK, and I'm already at 14 and it's only been three practices in spring training this year. It's my favorite hobby. So I would say bucket list. Everyone has to, to get a baseball at a baseball game. And if you don't think it can be done, I have a whole article that I wrote, but I don't have a quick link for that one, although I should. <laughs> so it is it is very much possible. Doug, have you ever gotten a baseball at a baseball game? No, no. And no, I have a red. I, all right. It's on a, what do you do with all these balls? What do you do with 120 baseballs? Give, it, give them to kids and stuff or get autographs on them. But I give, yeah. most, I give most of them away. What's your, most, what's your most prized baseball? I see a few behind uh, you. A Derek Jeter autograph on a Boston Red Sox ball. What? How'd you get that? Uh, it was They were in spring training. The Yankees were playing the Red Sox down here in Fort Myers. And I knew that he was going to walk the sideline and sign autographs. So the only ball I had in my pocket was a Boston Red Sox ball. So I ran down to the side. There's all these eight and 10 year old kids. Well, of course, I'm six foot one with huge wingspan. And I reach out over these kids, stick the ball right in front of Derek Jeter's face. He's annoyed. He grabs it, signs it, hands it back to me. Oh, that's Super. beautiful. Right there. I can show it to you. You want me to get it? It's yeah. Yeah. Let's see it. Anyway, that's awesome. Uh, and, and I'll just leave this open. Anything else you want to leave leaders with? That was beautiful. No, Doug, I'm just so thankful for you and proud of you. And I just, I really am. I'm thankful um, that God lets us do this. And so yeah. leaders, I think I would just say, stay humble and uh, stay on your face before the Lord because it is, um, it's the only way to live. And we, I really believe that. Hey, well, thanks, Matt, for the conversation. And thanks for all the resources and everything you do every day for the kingdom. You're welcome. Well, hey, Leader, thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Matt. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. You can find ways to connect with him and links to everything that we discussed in the show notes at l3leadership.org forward slash 364. And Leader, I say it every episode, but if you want to 10x your growth this year, then you need to either launch or join an L3 Leadership Mastermind Group. Mastermind groups are simply groups of six to 12 leaders that meet together on a consistent basis for at least one year in order to help each other grow, hold each other accountable, and to do life together. For me personally, mastermind groups have been the greatest source of growth in my life over the last eight years, and that is why I'm so passionate about them. So if you're interested in learning more about launching or joining a group, go to l3leadership.org forward slash masterminds or email me at dougsmith at l3leadership.org. And as always, I like to end every episode with a quote, and I'll quote Tim Keller today who said this. He said, don't let success go to your head, nor let failure go to your heart. So good. Well, leader, know that Laura and I love you. We believe in you and we say it every episode, but don't quit. Keep leading. The world desperately needs your leadership.